Are you looking to pursue a career in fashion? Today, I will be sharing with you six simple steps with underlying advice for different circumstances to help you enter the fashion industry and build a successful career. There are numerous opportunities to pursue a fulfilling, stable, and fruitful career based on your skill sets, studies, and talents. A common misconception around working in fashion is that it's shallow, it's a very frivolous industry, and that if you go into it trying to be a creative type, that you will become a starving artist. And this could not be further from the truth. While people who say these sorts of remarks may be meaning well, the industry is so vast, it's booming. More often than not, a dream is just deemed a dream and that it's not realistic, that it shouldn't happen, but it should, you should design your life you love. So many times when people think of the fashion industry, comes to mind are models and photographers, designers and makeup artists. While this is all very valid and true, that is just the surface. And we're going to be digging deeper into the forces of fashion, all the different areas and corners of the industry. A difficult pill to swallow, but you're going to have to realize that this is a journey. You're not going to get your dream straight out of the gate. In fact, your dream may evolve as you learn more and actually immerse yourself in the industry. Take Vera Wang, for example. We all know and love her work, right? She actually began a career in figure skating and went on to work at Vogue and Ralph Lauren before launching her own brand. See how many different turns your career took, but every step of it we can admire. The greatest of the fashion industry would not exist if they stopped on that path along the way. You have to keep going. You can follow your passions in a way that really embraces you as an individual, the same way that your style does. Style exists in many parts of our life, and one of that being our skill sets, talents, and personality. Today, I'm going to be discussing with you, no matter where your walk of life comes from, how to get into the fashion industry. Oh my loves, how are we doing today? Hope we're all well and having a beautiful day. If you're new, welcome. My name is Michelle and this is Clever and Chick. We discuss fashion and beauty on a deeper level through the use of art, theory, and social sciences so that you may bring them together in order to develop your true personal style that truly embraces you as a unique individual and view fashion past the traditional surface levels taken at because there's so much more than meets the eye. If this sounds good to you, please subscribe or if you're returning here, thank you so much for joining me here again today for a very special episode all about breaking into the fashion industry, whether you have a fashion degree or not, remote or in person. If you happen to be an individual interested specifically in styling, design, marketing or creative direction, this video is especially for you because this is my background. But if you are someone looking into a different sector of the industry, there's definitely advice applicable here today. This video is meant to be a stepping stone to show you wherever you are in life, that you can follow your passions. I know I don't have many younger viewers, but if you happen to be in high school and come across this video, it can be really great to shed some light on options you might not be aware of, or maybe you are in college, whether that be fashion school or not. Hopefully this can help you land a job straight out of school. Or maybe you're already working and you want to align your career with your passions. This can definitely show you how to transfer that skill set and that work background into this specific industry. Of my background, I have my bachelor's in communications with concentrations in graphic design as well as public relations. And I'm pursuing my higher education in psychology, fingers crossed a PhD. But when I began my career, I interned at a photography studio and went on to become a stylist at Saks Fifth Avenue. Here specifically, I worked with women's wear, ready to wear to really get in the nitty gritty details and went on to have the pleasure of working with numerous brands as a graphic designer. I was working with big and small brands, print and digital media as well, doing brand identity, photo retouching and executing campaigns. When the lockdown occurred, I continued working as a designer remotely, as well as doing styling and image consultation and of course, social media content production. If you are a returning viewer, you have definitely seen the development of Clever and Shake, this brand and it going in many different directions in terms of actual clothing design and books and services. This is more so social media and today we're going to be focusing more on careers in the industry, which leads me to my first step, determining your path, which is so much easier said than done. Because a lot of the time, people will discourage you saying, if you go into fashion, you will be a starving artist, or this is so frivolous, why are you pursuing this? You are not making good choices. When in fact, according to Fashion United, at the present moment, the industry is employing 300 million people. It's bigger in some countries than the automotive industry. Oh. 
Now, if you are one of these people who can go to fashion school, make the most of it, enjoy it, go to all the events and use all the resources at your disposal until of course that time is over and really use that network you've built in your career. But obviously not everyone can maybe do an unpaid internship or lives in a fashion hub where that industry is present. So I'm going to be showing you different ways to actually enter the industry more where fashion isn't as prominent. Know that there are remote options and so many opportunities to develop your career beyond what the public sees. It's not going to be printed in a magazine, it's not going to be in a runway or in a campaign. I want you to think of a company wherever you may live, one that's very vast of office building, and think about all the different departments and people that make this company function and work, what helps it reach its success. Ask yourself which department you would be in. You might be thinking, Michelle, I'm really in love with the glamour fashion. I want to have that lifestyle, the fashionable one I see in the movies and, and books. You need to realize that it's not as glamorous as it seems. Even on the creative side, it's quite grueling. But when you work in fashion, you really get to contribute to something bigger than yourself. You're a part of something that's so beautiful and really shaping the cultural landscape of the entire world. Understand that you're going to have to take a realistic route in order to make it reality. No one is here to make it happen for you, but that's part of the beauty. You can really use your own skill sets and talents and where you come from to get to where you wanna go. So say for instance, you are an analytical type. You always thrived in these sorts of classes and enjoy dressing up for class and went into work because you majored in maybe mathematics, cognitive sciences, human resources, or business these sorts of majors. You can get a really great career in fashion. Maybe you won't be a designer, but you can go on to become a maintenance technician, an architecture manager, a logistic analyst in fashion. There's pros and cons to being both creative and analytical. So definitely play to your strengths and don't look down on yourself because you're not the creative in type. Instead, understand that your skill sets with maybe mathematics can help contribute to the success of a collection reaching the target demographic make success in sales and managing those clients, making sure that everything is getting to where it needs to go, making beautiful displays functional. You have something to offer that's unique because of your skill sets and where you come from. Or maybe you are the more creative type and you've dreamed so much of becoming a designer, but don't have the connections or resources. You don't have to give up on your dream of designing clothes. If you have a knack for it, you can go and become a technical designer, for instance. Every brand needs one of those. Maybe your forte isn't actually in design, but you enjoy working with the clothes. You can become a buyer, a journalist, or a marketeer. Now, you may not be the face of the campaign, but it takes a village, and you can play a crucial role in making that campaign successful and as beautiful as possible. This note, in determining your path, you need to understand when to leave your ego at the door and go, I am contributing to something bigger than myself, a creative vision. I am helping to create a heritage. I am carrying on a legacy. But you also need to understand when to advocate for yourself. A lot of the time, people in fashion do not understand that their work deserves to be compensated. And this is something I do want to touch on a bit. So my good friend, I will not be disclosing his name due to the nature of the story. He was asked by someone close to him to create a dress. He sketched it out, made it exactly how she wanted, put time, material, resources, blood, sweat, and tears, his passion into creating this piece. When he delivered it to her, when came time for her to put it on, she loved it, and she didn't expect to pay him for this. I am not saying we are above anyone else at all. It is not like we are out here saving lives like surgeons or firefighters. But just the fact that we do not do this does not mean you devalue your work. When you devalue work, you devalue yourself, you devalue your clients, and put a cap on what you're capable of making because you will not have the time, energy, or resources to actually continue on your journey. So once you determine your direction, do not let anyone persuade you with their words. You have to understand when to advocate for yourself, but also, like I said, leave your ego at the door. So know when to pay your dues, but also to stand by your work. I will use myself as an example. So I used to think, oh, I'm just some girl creating videos on the internet. Even though I didn't show my face and everyone thought a team was working on this project, I was transferring all my skills I use in my professional work into this passion project. And I did it completely for free, hours on end, every single day for years. And then one day I received a message from someone who went to a fashion school and they told me, oh, I know you because I go to this school. 
and I had no idea they were playing my videos there. And I went, oh my goodness, I am not being compensated for my work, but they're good enough to be played in these schools. Thinking, wow, if professors can use my work, maybe I can become a professor myself. There's so many different directions your career can take. So say maybe your parents were kind enough to help you through school, but they say, we want you to get a practical degree. This is completely great. They want you to live a life where you are stable and you have a fruitful career. So say you study mathematics, like I was saying, and you go on to become an accountant. You can be an accountant at a fashion house or a publication and have that environment where it's so beautiful and glamorous, even though your work you don't think is glamorous. People will go, wow, you're an accountant at this brand, that's incredible. Be in the industry you love while embracing where you came from. Never look down on yourself, or even if you don't have formal schooling, network, ask someone if you can have them as a mentor, see different paths you can take. Never be afraid to try, as Virgil Abloh once said. The only failure is not to try. So determine your direction and not the goal, because you have to focus on becoming that person who's passionate and achieves and has these skill sets and capabilities in order to achieve the goal rather than the goal itself. That goal will probably change with time, live in the present, and really embrace the path that you're setting in front of yourself. So that way when you are rejected or if someone discourages you, you remain on your path. Now let's move on to step two, educating yourself on fashion. So the industry is so much more than wearing beautiful clothes and being beautiful yourself, about knowing about the latest and greatest trends, even for modeling. You must know that fashion, it's art, it's culture, it's history, technology, and so much more all in one. And it's very important for you to grasp the big picture as well as the finer details. Start with a historical perspective. Study different movements of style that define each decade. Understand why these movements even emerged and their social and cultural implications, how they shaped the fashion landscape. Familiarize yourself with major international fashion houses. Learn about their origins, iconic designers, creative directors, signature styles, and the impact on the global fashion scene through aesthetics. This knowledge will provide insights into the industry's evolution and where we are today, as well as why. Gain an understanding of the fashion calendar as well. Know when and where major fashion events are taking place. Even beyond fashion capitals such as Paris, Milan, London, and New York. Understand the significance of these events in setting trends and influencing the world we live in. These topics that I mentioned throughout each episode of the videos I create here on the YouTube channel, but definitely look to other resources as well, such as documentaries, podcasts, books, or if you're in school and have access to a digital library, look at research papers. There's many different resources out there, but here on the channel, I can recommend specifically the designer videos that really concentrate and showcase their work as well as give historical and sociological contexts, such as the impact of YSL, or my Mad Men analysis of Megan and Betty, where I showcase the social circumstances in everyday lives in relation to the designers of this era. I believe I only have a few, but I also do have some virtual exhibitions of style icons and designers here on the channel, and this is actually a really great resource as well. If you live somewhere with a prominent fashion scene, look at the museums and see if there are any touring exhibitions. Typically these are international and will circulate through different museums, and they're really great not to just see and learn, but also network. Do not be afraid to ask questions. More often than not, people will be happy to answer them. If they're not happy to answer them, simply just move on from the situation. It definitely helps if you do have these basics down though, because then you will know which questions to ask. It'll actually foster this means of respect. You know, if you can tell the difference between Chanel and Dior, very basic things, this will allow you to ask more proper questions. Remember, the fashion industry is dynamic and always evolving, so fast paced. You must continuously learn and have this curiosity, harness your passion. And this will not only allow you to remain relevant, this will not only contribute to your style, but also your success and creativity. You can also develop a bit of a cutting edge and allow your work to speak for itself when you understand why, when, and where it comes from. If you do happen to maybe make a mistake, do not beat yourself up. Most of the time, people are likely to help you. There are certain elements of fashion that are stereotypical, but true in certain 
certain corners of the industry. Personally, I believe that's a bit more of a minority that's loud because even when you watch documentaries such as Dior and I, you see in Raf's Atelier, it's tense at times, but it's quite a calm atmosphere. It's not what people typically envision fashion to be. Be able to have an intelligent conversation about fashion, both written and verbal. I think anyone who has an interest in fashion even can remember a time where they were dismissed as, oh, you just like fashion, you're some fashion girl, you're some guy who's into fashion. But once you actually spoke about your thoughts and maybe explained your style or why you liked a designer, people looked at you and went, wow, I never thought of it this way. Alexander McQueen once said, there is an underlying message. It's usually only the intellectual ones who understand what's going on in what I do. Fashion is so much more than just clothes. That's like saying a song is just sound or a book is just words. And when you develop your communication skills and make them as strong as can be with that educational backing, you begin to create these very unique perspectives. And this can aid in the development of your work, of your look and how you convey yourself. You can stand by what you create or what you have to offer. We live in a day and age where this is very digital as well. You want to be able to write to others, maybe an industry insider ask about a position and sound just as stylish as you are, to sound capable, to sound articulate, or maybe your own person at an event, you want to be able to speak well to them and go into that conversation with confidence. There's so many different ways to work with fashion terminology and communications, and that's truly the beauty of it, because the same way you can bring clothes together to create your style, is the same exact way you can deliver your thoughts to develop a signature way of speech. Even the language that you use helps to create your style, and you want that to be as strong as possible. It's good to have a rich vocabulary, I think we can all agree on that. So let's break this down out of the context of actual words. When you go out shopping with your friend, you have your signature look, something that truly embodies your essence. They can say, wow, look at that mannequin, the outfit they're wearing, it reminds me so much of you because of your signature. Now take signature in a different context. When you write your name down on a paper, it's distinct to you even if someone has the same exact name. Their signature isn't the same as yours. This is the same exact way as the language of fashion. Even though we're all using the same words, we have our own way of using them. And this in turn creates a higher sense of style. Say for example, I say, I really love chic and elegant style. For me, I envision a Celine or YSL woman, but someone else may envision a Dior or Tom Ford woman. See how all these images are vastly different. We can all explain why they're elegant or even why they are not in different ways. There's so many different ways to work with fashion terminology and communications. And that's truly the beauty of it, because the same way you can bring clothes together to create your style is the same way that you can actually talk about this. The fashion industry is one with a backbone in aesthetics. It's social and heavily relies on connections. And this isn't just a person's connection to the clothing, but connections to one another. It is so incredible anyone who wants to go into fashion has such a great sense of style and you want to have that substance to match it that when people look at you they respect you and when you speak they respect you even more because of your thoughts opinions and interpretations when you speak and you say i'm an ideal candidate for this position because xyz or when you pitch an idea or a design a concept or maybe a process and you can actually back that as to why it works and where it stands in terms of the industry people may agree with it or they will go oh that is so great let's tweak it a bit so you truly reach a new level of style because style is not just the clothes you wear it's how you wear it it's how you move how you speak how you form your thoughts and how you convey them so say for instance i'm working as a stylist with a client struggling with body image issues i need to be able to explain why certain styling techniques benefit them so even though they are looking in the mirror and they feel confident because they see they can look good they'll understand why they look good and be able to implement this technique themselves. Say I'm working on brand identity and I'm explaining why these color palettes are effective, why this design element is crucial to conveying their heritage, or why this certain typography will not work in this way, but we can adapt it to work in another. Or let's remove it out of my forte. Say maybe there's a... Um let's do a visual merchandiser. And they're doing all the displays and putting certain pieces with one another. And it's the seasonal holiday. They need to do this big overhaul. 
So they reference an archival brand element that evokes this warm vintage essence. It's perfect to modernize for Christmas. They say it will create an immersive experience. And because of this, people will be drawn to the shop. Be effective in washing over that feeling of the brand identity and the holiday and in turn driving up sales because of that. Time and time again, I'm personally asked about different styling tips or how to design, analyze fashion or different subjects I cover in the videos on the channel. It's inspired me to create a resource derived from my studies and work to pass on to you today. It is titled The Little Chic Fashion Dictionary, How to Speak Stylishly with Fashion Communications and Terminology. Each term is defined in detail, including pronunciation, part of speech, the language of origin, and the specific subset of the fashion industry to which it belongs to, as well as illuminating examples to make them all the more memorable. I truly love making fashion more digestible and accessible to those of you who are just getting into it or providing this space for seasoned fashionistas to come together and share this passion of others because not everyone has this sort of space in their life. And the fact that I got to produce a book in this sort of image inspired by this community and really this lifelong journey I've been on of the art of fashion and learning and working and creating is just this dream come true for me. So I hope I can pass this on to you in a sense. And even though I know I cannot make this happen for everyone, I hope that this will help you a bit on your way to creating, to speaking, to having the style you wish to and designing the life that you love. I've done a giveaway in the community tab since I understand many of the Chic League members are active here, but I wish to do another one in this video, so if you're interested in winning a copy of the Little Chic Fashion Dictionary, please subscribe and like this video, as well as head over to Instagram, follow, and leave a comment with a black heart emoji on any photo. Now for step four. If you love fashion, you must branch out. And even though this sounds incredibly counterintuitive, you do not want to be one of these people who can only talk about fashion and have no awareness of things like world events or identity or talk about foods or talk about fitness or other areas of life. I believe it's rather natural, your first instinct to go, oh, I should learn a lot about fashion and truly immerse myself in it if you want to work in this industry but you need to retain this peripheral vision of the world and in turn you'll gain a peripheral vision of style. It's easy for anyone to gain tunnel vision of their passion and if you love fashion, you can live it, you can breathe it, but you have to understand it's very immersed in the world. It's not the standalone, isolated entity. Say for instance, you love tennis and you played tennis. You have this great understanding of movement. You can translate that into fashion, into your work. Now, as a stylist, of course, I have the body type and look that I have, but I have to be able to work with anyone's look, anyone's body type, anyone's gender. So even though I don't know the experience of being a man and wearing menswear or having a fuller figure for a woman, I can still work with these body types and looks because of art theory, because of science, and apply different concepts to fashion and in turn be able to work with anyone and create looks that really embrace them, that really empower them. This is an overall goal of my work, and if I was not aware of art theory or social sciences, I wouldn't be able to do this to the extent that I do. And maybe I'm working with a fashion brand and I'm doing some designs for them. Knowing about fashion is not going to make me good at motion capture, it's not going to make me good at layout design, it's not going to make me good at typography. While fashion does possess elements of art, it also possesses elements of science. So having a background in either of these areas can be really great to adapt to the industry. And if you are an analytical or creative type, you don't have to be discouraged by one lacking the other. Instead, really play to your strengths and find a way to translate that. Many designers have spoken about their creative process, and it's not just logical facts of garment construction or romantic concepts and execution. Fashion is not only inspired, but functions within the world. In a conversation between Mutual Prada and Ralph Simmons, taken from Prada's Spring Summer 21 Showcase, me just stated it better than I ever could. You say, study, 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 <laughs> learn, watch movies, uh, watch art, read literature, and learn that uh, a piece of clothing serves uh, the, uh, the rule of making you live better. So it's for you and it's for your life. So it's not an abstract, an abstract job. The result of my job is that people with my clothes 
probably feel feel a bit better they can mm. live a, a bit better so it has to be useful mm. and help define your personality even if you want to change one day you want to be somebody one day you want to be uh, somebody else depends the occasion so really think about that is this an instrument for your life. Raf Simmons has also been very vocal in another interview stating, there is a very different kind of psychology going on in the fashion scene than in art. I don't want to show clothes. I want to show my attitude, my past, present, and future. I use memories and future visions and try to place them in today's world. When you watch a fashion show, television, or films, go into it with the eye of a creator or an analyst, not a consumer. Ask yourself, why is it the way it is? Look at show notes. For instance, Alexander McQueen's Spring Summer 2005, It's Only a Game, was based on the concept of a chess match between America and Japan, inspired by a scene in the Harry Potter films. Each look is made in the image of a particular chess piece, and the models move along the runway as if they were on the chessboard, mirroring real life historical events, completely inspired by 18th century silhouettes and traditional kimono pieces with embroidery. The collection was lighter and more accessible, hence reaching a wider audience due to the romance and femininity of the collection. There was so much to unpack just with this single fashion show. For instance, how was this film seem adapted into the fashion industry? How did it become a runway show instead of a concept in a movie? And what historical events are present on this chessboard? How are 18th century pieces constructed? What is the background of the kimono? How is the artistry of the pieces adapted to each chess piece? Do this in everyday life as well. When you go out to these stores, look at the layouts, go, why is this piece in the window? Why is the mannequin styled this way? Why are these displays beside one another? Or when you are watching a video and the ad pops up, ask yourself, how was this edited? How did they produce this? I understand sometimes this may be overwhelming. So I have two videos for my recommendations on the channel to begin. One is on the semiotics of fashion and how to create your true style and aesthetic. Now let's move on to the next step. Find your motivator. There's going to be times when you're tired. There's going to be times when things are difficult. There's going to be times where you're working very hard and you need to have this fire within you, but also find a way to channel this fire into your work. You need to be able to recognize your strengths and weaknesses. Hone your strengths, channel your weaknesses and transform them into something stronger. Let's look at one of the greatest designers, Yves Saint Laurent. He once said, what is wonderful about my art is that dream and reality can become one. There is just one step between the two. His genius and elegance came from what so many people deem as weakness, his sensitivity. People wrote him off as delusional, but his vision and philosophy transformed the entire landscape of fashion and the way people go about their style today. Salman, he spoke about in a rare interview, how his bullying helped him create his vision, jackets being a bit too big, having a slim silhouette. In these times, he looked to his music heroes and stayed at home. He felt connected to their allure, aesthetic, and style. If you have a hard moment, you must transform this baggage into a toolbox so that it doesn't weigh you down on this journey of creating this dream of working in fashion. I know so many people who have been strong enough to push through have such similar stories of pursuing this dream and on that journey of making it reality, receiving maybe a snide remark or being told that they're not good enough when in fact they are. And I I imagine if you are watching this video, you have this as well. I believe it was Anise Nin, hopefully I'm pronouncing her name correctly. She once said, had I not created my own world, I would have certainly died in others. I know this seems a bit dramatic, but to some people, this is reality. You must have this fire in you and feel worthy of your desires, even if it's not about this, just in general, but we're speaking on this topic of pursuing a career specifically in the fashion industry. Share my motivator and show how you can adapt it and actually use it to your advantage in your work. When I was younger, if you watched my Q&A, you are aware, I love fashion so much. Ever since I was a young girl, it was just such a big part of my life. As I got a bit older, I felt ill and the only thing that sustained me in this time, as ridiculous as it sounds, was reading magazines, seeing the beautiful fashion, the art, the models, reading the different articles, the culture and events. It sustained me in a way that empowered me and I had this calling to pass this on to others. So in times of doubt, in times of ridicule, in times where I felt unsure, 
I always was able to regain focus of the vision and hone my skills to this extent. Because of my intellectual pursuits and these experiences combined, I can write, design, style, and even produce in ways that empower people in a very specific way. A lot of people are told that they can't do it, that they're not good enough, but I'm here to tell you that you are. It doesn't matter where you come from, what you've experienced, and I'm not saying to leverage your traumas and tap into them and create from them. I mean, you can if you want to, but what I'm saying is that People who put you down see something within you. I believe it was Aristotle who said, to avoid criticism, say nothing, do nothing, be nothing. If I had listened to words of people who were saying, who on earth should listen to you sounding and looking the way you do, I wouldn't have helped as many people as I have, and I would not trade this for the world. There is something within you, and if people are putting you down, don't listen to them. If you have this calling to be in this industry, don't let people talk you out of it. Don't let people put down the industry and what you love. You love it for a reason, and there's no shame in what you love. If you let your feelings dictate the actions that you take, it'll be very difficult to stay on this path. Instead, what you need to do is learn from your losses and celebrate your wins. If you don't even hear back from a position, do not feel like a failure, you are not an imposter. And if you do land a position, make the most of it. Use this to develop a stronger mindset, a thicker skin and channel it into your work. Use it to stay on your path so that no one's words, whether that be in your personal life or professional life, will persuade you off the path that you know is meant for you. The greatest of the fashion industry would not exist if they stopped on that path along the way. You have to keep going. Now for the last step developing your portfolio. This seems very straightforward, but there's actually a few key objectives that you want to meet with your portfolio when showcasing your work. Everyone's portfolio is going to look different. For instance, a fashion buyer's versus a UX designer's. For me, my portfolio has many different sections and likely yours will as well. Mine are writing, illustration, print, and digital design, as well as motion graphics and video. But there's objectives that you want to meet with each section. So let's delve into this. Now on the subject of portfolios, the first thing you must do is establish your goals Make your portfolio's purpose clear. Do you want to showcase your creations, land a job, get clientele, or collaborate? You may even have various versions of your portfolio. Just personalize it as needed and opt for your finest work. Cut out the weaker and less varied parts. Save space for the best. And for the sake of diversity, show that you can adapt. Be sure to include different ranges of style, methods, and projects, even collaborative projects, which will not only enhance your portfolio, but expand your network and skill sets as you work with different individuals of complementary skills. In addition to technical skills, emphasize soft skills and highlight them, such as work ethic, communication, emotional intelligence, integrity, time management, conflict resolution, creativity, and teamwork. These qualities, more often than not, are just as important because you're not just pitching your technical expertise, but rather what you have to offer in terms of a company or in terms of working one-on-one -on -one with a client. And make your theme consistent. Create a unifying idea or topic to serve as the binding for your portfolio and presentation. There's many potential avenues for this. It could be through aesthetics, color palettes, or style. Obviously, if you work on different projects or if different clients, you will likely have very different looks on each project, but make sure your distinct contribution is evident for this hour of professionalism and refinement. And this may be achieved through consistency so that when someone is flipping through your portfolio, even though it may be collaborative or freelance work, they will still be able to tell what you did. Also put your tasks in a way that are easy to navigate. So in an order that makes sense or is simple to follow, like someone who has never seen your work before or someone who's not even familiar with fashion. Think about making folders for your work, arranging them in chronological order, or even by your unique skill sets. Viewers will have an easier time looking through your work and a portfolio that's well organized. People don't wanna fuss around, they want to get straight to the point. 
This is the prime time to set the scene. Put a short description of each project next to it. Break out the idea, maybe what motivated you or the tools that you employed, or maybe even obstacles that you conquered. For instance, cultural sensitivity in a global business environment. It not only gives the viewer background, but shows how each item was conceptualized and executed. Within your portfolio, you also want to display your philosophy. This is something very unique everyone has to offer. Include any relevant drawings, excerpts from books, mood boards, or even behind the scenes photos to show how you came up with this idea or why it is effective. This provides a more in-depth look into your process. Everyone has a unique process and enhances your delivery. Many times when hiring a designer or analyst, the company or client wants to understand the process that's going to be involved, which is such a prime opportunity to share your story. Personalize your networking conversations by sharing your journey, experiences, background, and passions that drives you in your work. People connect more deeply when they understand the story behind your creations. This could make a client more comfortable working with you or offer a company a unique perspective that they're currently lacking and are looking for. Now for the final finishing touch of a portfolio and share testimonials. If you've received positive feedback from clients, colleagues, or mentors, consider incorporating them in your portfolio or sharing them on your networking platforms or personal sites. Positive testimonials not only validate your skills, but also your professionalism. I actually have your testimonials on cleverandchic.com from those of you who are kind enough to share your words. For examples of how you can exemplify your skill sets and the effect they have, it's not about just what you do, but also the impact your work holds. This is so wonderful for pitching and networking because you're not just showing off your technical skills, but actually you as an individual through your work and meeting those objectives that can really land you a client or a job. And remember when networking, it's not always about what others can do for you, but what you can do in the industry and in turn return to that. It might not be overnight, but be proud of wherever you are in this journey, whether it's the beginning, middle, or towards the end. It's always going to be evolving and it's something you should be proud of for yourself, that you have the courage to go on this journey and make your dream a reality. I do really wish you luck and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe, like, turn on notifications and comment. Thank you so much for watching.